Bom dia a todos e a todas. Nós vamos dar início a mais um webinário é, coordenado pela Pró-Reitoria de Pós-Graduação e Pesquisa, com o apoio da nossa reitoria e sob a coordenação do professor Elbert Macau. Sejam todos bem-vindos, é um prazer tê-los aqui. E hoje teremos o nosso palestrante, Dr. Bruce. Dr. Bruce, thank you for attention and time with us. It's a pleasure for Unifest to hear you. É, passo a palavra, então, para o doutor, professor Elbert. Bom dia. Bom dia a todos. Obrigado por estarem aqui conosco. É, é, vou mudar para inglês, ok? Uh, good morning. It's a really a great pleasure to have you here. And uh, the cycle of seminars is a tribute to the distinguished professor of the Escola Paulista de Medicina, Dr. Nestor Shor, who died in 2018. Professor Shor has made several outstanding contributions in nephrology, occupying the position of prorector of postgraduate study and research at university, at UNIFESP, and he was the president of International Congress of Nephrology in 2007, and he got several distinguished awards, like best scientific article uh, and another and got a lot of positions. And uh, today we have our speaker, we have the honor to receive uh, Dr. Bruce Bannard. Dr. Bruce is a principal investigator of the INSIGHT mission. He is a planetary geophysicist at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. He holds a BS in physics and a PhD in geophysics from the University of Southern California. And he has worked in Earth and Space Science Division of JPL since 1977. Dr. Barnett has served on a number of NASA and National Academy of Science advisory panels on planetary and space science. And he has published over 130 journal articles, reports, and book chapter, chapters. His research focus on the geological history of the planet Mars and geophysical investigation of the interiors of the terrestrial planets using analysis of gravity, magnetic topography, and seismic data. He has participated in several planetary flights, instrument teams, including the MOLA, Altimeter, or Mars Global Survivor, and the image radar of Magellan mission to Venus and he served as project scientist for the Spirit and Opportunity Mars hovers for six years. Uh, Professor Bernard, it's really a great pleasure and honor to have you here. And now I handle the word for you, our um, podium. And after the end, we open for questions. Thank you so much, Professor Bruce. <laughs> Well, I'm really pleased to be here. I, I really in, enjoy uh, sharing the, my, my uh, excitement about this mission to Mars and, and the, the amazing science that uh, we're discovering. So today I'm going to talk about how we explore the depths of Mars with uh, a single uh, lander on Mars, the, the InSight, InSight rover. So let's see if I can get this to um, advance. Okay, so the, the mission objectives of InSight were, were determined uh, about 15 years ago when we first put together the proposal. Sorry, so, Dr. Bernard, we fix. Oh, now, okay. Okay, now our presentation is on the video. Okay, um, and, and this mission was, was designed to be the first mission to actually investigate the deep interior of Mars. There have been missions that uh, have looked at the geology of the surface, at the atmosphere, at the, the magnetosphere, but no mission before has actually looked uh, deep below the surface down through the crust, mantle, and core. So InSight was designed to do that for the first time. And in doing that, uh, InSight's acts like a time machine. So it travels back more than 100 years uh, to the dawn of the 20th century on Earth where uh, scientists were asking basic questions about uh, how the Earth was, was made, what the Earth was, its structure, you know, how it was put together. Um, they wanted to know the thickness of the crust and the mantle, um, the, the size and density of the core, um, what kind of uh, distribution the seismic activity had over the planet and the heat flow. 
And, and these were basic uh, questions about, about our planet during uh, the gravitational attraction of the moon as, as, as it uh, passed overhead. But his uh, 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 device picked up this funny vibration. And a few months later, he read in the newspaper that there had been a, an earthquake in Tokyo. And he realized that uh, he'd actually measured the, the waves from that earthquake uh, traveling through the earth uh, in Germany. And so this was the first detection of, of a, a remote detection of an earthquake. And it, it sort of kicked off the whole science of seismology. So within about uh, 10, 15 years, uh, the science of seismology had advanced to the point where uh, it was possible to actually uh, uh, detect the Earth's core uh, using seismology, using the travel times of, of uh, waves from various earthquakes. And so uh, Richard Oldham uh, was able to actually detect and to, to measure the size of the Earth's core for the first time using seismology in 1906. And just a few years later, uh, Andrea Mohoricic uh, in Croatia was able to use uh, the, the waves from a quake uh, bouncing off the, the bottom of the crust and coming back up to the seismograms at the seismometers at the surface to measure the thickness of the crust below uh, Croatia, what we now call the Moho after, after uh, a shortening of his uh, rather difficult to pronounce name. Um, and so, so at this point, uh, we know the, the, the thickness of the crust and could start to extrapolate that thickness around the earth and, and, and find it in other places. Um, uh, about uh, 25 years later, uh, Inge Lehmann was able to actually detect the inner core of the earth uh, using, uh, again, the, the, the waves from earthquakes uh, on the other side of the planet. Uh, this was a very, uh, very difficult and, and uh, amazing uh, uh, scientific feat. Um, and, and she was actually not, not uh, believed for, for many years. It took about 10 years before other uh, seismologists were able to uh, duplicate her detection and, and, and uh, realize that, that uh, what she had done was actually valid. And so um, this was, we now had uh, sort of the structure of the earth from the crust all the way down to the very center of the earth, all through seismology over the course of about 40 years. And then finally, um, uh, Gutenberg and, and Richter uh, were able to map out the, the sort of distribution of, of, of earthquakes across the Earth uh, and, and uh, understanding what the, what, where, they, where they occurred on the Earth and found that they occurred in these belts, which eventually were um, used to help uh, develop the theory of plate tectonics as, as we know it today. Uh, this was the first indication that there were um, separate plates that were moving next to each other, uh, causing uh, earthquakes as they, as they moved past each other and um, uh, sort of starting to verify the, uh, the theory of Wegener who had uh, advanced the theory of uh, these plate tectonic uh, motions uh, uh, somewhat earlier. And so Within about 50 years, geophysicists went from the first detection of an earthquake to a complete understanding uh, of the basic structure of the planet Earth. Um, and so um, with insight, we had the, the hubris to try to attempt to do this for only two years on Mars. And, and, and it turns out that with, uh, with almost three years of data, we're finally starting to answer these questions. Uh, we've been able to go through the entire uh, sort of history of Earth seismology in the space of about two or three years, which is uh, quite an incredible accomplishment scientifically. So what does the Mars structure look like? So this is a figure from an article that I, I wrote with others in the Encyclopedia of the Solar System in 2014. And we were looking at the, the structure of the, of the terrestrial planets. And here we can see uh, the Earth on the left, and you can see it has a, a crust, a mantle, uh, with, that has uh, several different uh, divisions in it, an outer core and an inner core. And we have the, the depths of all these different boundaries, and we have an understanding of the, the density of the composition. Um, for the moon, we also have uh, 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 measurements of this, these same properties. We know the, the thickness of its basaltic crust, we know the size of the of its uh, 
core, and we know the, the basic uh, composition of the moon. And this is, we know, mostly from a combination of seismic uh, measurements from Apollo and also of uh, samples that were returned and, and analyzed in the laboratories of, of the rocks on the moon. But for Mars, I think the, the, the key thing about this picture is that there's question marks at each of these uh, different boundaries. Uh, we know that it has, we knew that it had a crust, we knew that it had a core, uh, that we can get from uh, measurements of, of gravity and, and, and rotation, but we had only guesses as to, you know, what the sizes of, of these features were, what the depths to the various different boundaries were. So this was the mystery that, uh, that InSight was, was uh, designed to, to solve. So uh, InSight's a time machine in, in another way as well. Uh, instead of going back 120 years, we can actually go back four and a half billion years uh, to the beginnings of the solar system. And it will help us to understand the processes of planetary differentiation. This is the process by which a planet goes from uh, of, of, of just uh, the dust in the, in the nebula to the planet we see today. So what we want to do is understand um, those very, very early processes of, of planetary formation. And how does that work? Well, we know a little bit about how terrestrial planets form. They start to form by the accretion, the uh, uh, agglomeration together of the dust in the solar nebula, of this meteoritic material. This is uh, sort of the, the basic carbonaceous chondrite material in, in the solar system. And as these, as these clumps, these groups of, of uh, dust grow, uh, they begin to heat up, uh, both from the, the kinetic energy of the particles and impacting them, and also from the radioactive uh, materials, radioactive elements uh, uranium and thorium uh, in, in those materials. Um, at that point, something magical happens and you end up with a planet with, with, with a crust, mantle, and core with very distinct and non-meteoritic mineralogy. So there's, there's no rock that you pick up on the Earth today that has the same composition as a, a meteorite. Uh, these rocks have all been changed into something different, into the rocks in the crust, which are, are relatively low density, uh, the rocks in the mantle, which are very dense, uh, iron rich, and then the core itself, which is uh, uh, molten iron and nickel. So what we want to do is use insight to, to take away the magic of this, this process and understand the processes that allowed the planet to go from a homogeneous mass of meteorite into the very diverse and interesting planet that we see today. So the process of differentiation uh, occurs as the planet melts, as the, the protoplanet melts. Uh, as it melts, of course, the, the uh, metallic iron starts to con condense out into droplets of, of pure iron nickel. It's much, much denser than the rocks around it, the molten rocks around it, and so it falls down to create the metallic core. Um, later, as the, the uh, silicate uh, rocks start to crystallize, um, the heavier uh, crystals out of this uh, material sink to the bottom to create a, an olivine, a pyroxene rich cumulic uh, mantle. And finally, uh, for the moon, uh, we have the lighter materials that start to crystallize and float to the surface to create the crust. And so this is the basic process by which uh, planets form. Uh, but we don't actually um, have the, precisely the same uh, processes that happen on the Earth because the Earth is much larger than the Moon. Um, the Earth is, is, uh, has pressures and temperatures that far exceed those in the Moon. And so um, we have to be able to um, go somewhere else to, to, to um, make those measurements. So uh, we'd like to make the measurements on the Earth. That's the most uh, accessible place, obviously. We're right here. We can measure it. But unfortunately, most of that uh, evidence has been destroyed over the last four and a half billion years, uh, both by plate tectonics, which has taken the original crust and completely uh, recycled it through the mantle and, and remelted it and brought it back up so we don't have any crust from the, the earliest formation. And also the mantle itself is being stirred very vigorously by um, solid state convection, by uh, hot material rising, cold material sinking, and stirring up the mantle. And so uh, we really don't have that information on the Earth anymore. Um, we've gone to the moon and we can uh, make these measurements on the Earth moon. The moon uh, uh, retains its um, uh, 
pantheons from uh, very well from uh, four and a half billion years ago. But the pressure and temperature conditions, as I said, are very limited. Uh, you go down to the very center of the moon and you're only at conditions which correspond to about 125 miles deep in the Earth. Um, so Mars turns out to be a very good laboratory for these measurements. It's uh, large enough to undergone most of the terrestrial processes, but small enough to retain the activity. And so um, we like to say that Mars is sort of the Goldilocks planet. It's not too big, it's not too small, it's just right, like the, the fairy tale. So um, the best way to do those measurements, the best way to understand the thickness of that crust, the size of the core, which gives us the, the information we need to understand those processes is through seismology, as I've, as I've described before. So, uh, but operating a seismometer is very difficult. You have to make measurements of very, very small motions. Uh, our target was two and a half times 10 to the minus nine meters per second squared uh, per root hertz, um, which is uh, very difficult to imagine, but it's actually, uh, to, uh, corresponds to uh, motions that are smaller than the size of a hydrogen atom. And so on Mars, we have to compensate for all the different noise sources. We have to uh, compensate for the noise of the instrument itself, uh, temperature variations in the, and wind uh, uh, from the atmosphere. Uh, pressure will, will affect the seismometer as well as magnetic field and vibrations of the lander. And so um, it's, we have to try to, to to make an instrument that has such a low noise level that we can see these very, very tiny vibrations. And we were uh, successfully able to do this. And the um, payoff is on Mars, um, this, the, the environment is much, much quieter than the Earth. On the Earth, we have uh, uh, the atmosphere, we have the oceans. And even if you go to the uh, center of the, the quietest continent on the Earth, you can still with seismic, seismometers, uh, see the, the vibrations from the ocean waves hitting the, uh, the continental uh, margins. Um, and we have, uh, that, that creates noise that's a thousand times greater than on Mars. And so uh, uh, we were able to, to uh, provide, make an instrument that was able to measure down this far, and we had to be able to uh, shield it from the uh, noise sources that were present on Mars. And in, to do that, we had to isolate these instruments from their environment. So this uh, photo shows three of our, of our actual seismic sensors, which we call very broadband or VBB sensors. Um, these are about the size of, of my fist, each one. And these are the sensors that are able to measure down at the sort of atomic level of, of motion. But in order to make those measurements uh, valuable, be able to, to measure the ground motion and not the motion of everything else in the environment, we had to isolate it from everything that's going on. And so you can see those three sensors uh, in many, many different layers of isolation. And then the first is a vacuum vessel so that we have no contact with the rest of the atmosphere. Plus we have a vacuum uh, insulation from the, the uh, thermal variations. Uh, then we put another sort of uh, 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 thermos, thermal shield around it, um, which shields it uh, even once more from the uh, temperature variations. And finally, we, we put a windshield over it to, to, to shield it from the winds on Mars. Uh, Mars's atmosphere is only about uh, 1% the uh, density of the Earth, but we still have winds on Mars, and even those very, very uh, light winds will, will cause uh, variations. And so we're able to, to um, um, shield the seismometer by about a factor of a thousand from the, the thermal uh, variations, which are very large on Mars, and the winds on Mars. Um, finally, we, we, we have uh, one more problem, uh, which is a, it turns out to be a really difficult problem, one that you might not think about, but after uh, uh, flying for about 400 million kilometers to get to Mars, we landed on Mars, which is uh, a, an amazing feat, but still the seismometer is about a meter from its, its target. It's sitting on the deck of the spacecraft. This uh, kind of reddish orange object is the seismometer, which flew to Mars on the deck of the spacecraft. But what we want to measure is the motion of the ground. And this is a, a familiar prob problem because back in the 1970s, uh, the Viking mission went to Mars. It carried seismometers to Mars, the two Vikings, but the seismometers were bolted to the deck of the spacecraft. And uh, they did not have the resources at that time to be able to place it on the surface. So the seismometer and the ground uh, were not together. And the consequence of this was that the wind, when it blew 
it would shake the, the, the Viking spacecraft and the seismometer would measure the shaking of the spacecraft and the ground motion was never, never uh, measured by the seismometer. So in order to do that, um, InSight went through a very uh, lot of trouble to put the seismometer on the ground. So this is right after landing, we deployed our solar arrays and InSight has a robotic arm that actually had a grapple to pick up the seismometer, uh, place it on the ground. And we spent about uh, a month taking photos of the ground, stereo photos, figuring out the exact best place on the ground to place it without any rocks under it. And we're able to put the seismometer on the ground about a meter and a half away from the spacecraft. Thus it's isolated from spacecraft motions and it's in contact with the ground in order to make those very, very fine measurements of, uh, of seismic motion. And finally, after the seismometer was on the ground and leveled and ready for, for a measurement, we went back with our robotic arm, picked up this um, windshield and placed it over the seismometer to isolate it from the wind. Um, so in, in this animation, it only takes about 30 seconds to do all this. Uh, on Mars itself, it took us about three months to, to complete this process because we had to be extremely careful uh, to make sure that everything went just right. So um, what kind of data are we getting back from Mars? So this is what the scientists actually look at uh, each day uh, when it comes down from Mars. This is a full uh, day of data. You know, it goes from um, midnight on the left through noon at the middle of this figure to uh, midnight again on the right. And uh, the vertical axis is frequency. So on the bottom are, um, are vibrations that are very slow, about once per minute, very slow vibrations. Um, the line across the, the middle is about one cycle per second, which is a fairly quick vibration. And then up to the top is 10 cycles per second, which is very, very fast indeed. And so we can see, as a scientist, we can see uh, the variation of uh, motion on the surface as a function of time and a function of frequency. And the important thing is what does, where, where is there actually Mars quakes that we see? And there's lots of stuff going on in this, this, this uh, thing, and I'm not going to go into the detail, but the important thing are these two little uh, smudges over here. They're, they're just a little bit of, uh, of uh, reddish in, in this deep purple. Those are our Mars quakes. Um, and when we blow that up in time, you can see here uh, the, the P wave, the S wave, and if you have any um, familiarity with, with seismology, you know that this is the compressional wave, the shear wave that gives us the information we want about the interior of, of Mars. Um, the way seismology works is that uh, a, a, a quake, an earthquake or a Mars quake, shakes the planet and it creates waves. It creates waves that are similar to sound waves, but they go through the solid part of the planet. And as these waves move through the planet, they're affected by the material. Um, they go at different velocities, they go with different uh, polarizations, their paths get bent, They're, they can bounce off of, of layers, they can actually get refracted uh, through layers, the same way that light gets refracted in a prism. And so when we get the waves back up at a seismometer, we have ways to analyze these waves to figure out all the different things that have affected them as they've gone through the planet. And so um, it's very much like a... Uh, 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 a CAT scan that images the inside of, of your body when you go to the doctor or uh, magnetic resonance uh, imaging. Uh, it is able to use these waves to actually uh, make an image, a picture of the inside of the planet. So um, if you take this uh, uh, data here and collapse it down to a single line, and then you put one line on this image for every single uh, day on Mars, this is an image of the entire data set of seismology that we have from Mars. And you can see that it has a very uh, repeating pattern, okay? So first of all, again, we're starting from, uh, the top is the beginning of seismometer operations about 80, uh, 80 days into uh, Mars. And the bottom is the most recent, uh, the, the one that we just got uh, yesterday, or actually in this case, uh, yeah, today or yesterday. Um, and you can see that uh, the orange, the, the yellow and orange colors mean that you have very large vibrations. And these are vibrations from the wind. So even though we are uh, shielding the seismometer itself from the wind, the wind shakes the ground, the wind shakes the, the lander. And so we get motions of the ground from the wind. And so during the day, we have relatively high winds 
we have uh, large motions, but in the night, we have quiet times. The purples are very, very quiet times. Of, so we have a background over which we can actually detect very small Mars quakes. And these are the Mars quakes that we've seen. We've seen uh, over a thousand Mars quakes so far. Uh, most of them are extremely small. If you're um, aware of the, the, the magnitude scale for, for, for earthquakes, uh, most of these uh, Mars quakes are magnitude two, magnitude two and a half. Um, but we have a very few that are a little bit larger, magnitude three to magnitude four. We actually have a pair of magnitude 4.2 quakes that we got just a, a couple of months ago. Uh, on the Earth, these are fairly minor quakes. You wouldn't even uh, uh, pay much attention to them scientifically. You wouldn't see them for more than a, a few hundred kilometers. But on Mars, uh, Mars is a smaller planet. Mars is a more quiet planet, and so these quakes can can go all the way through the entire planet and give us the information about the depths that we're that we're uh, that we're looking for. So here's uh, uh, one of the Mars quakes, and again you can see the P wave and the S wave, and the distance between these waves in time tells you how far away it is. So if a quake is very close, the P wave and the S wave will come in very close together, uh, since the S wave goes a little bit slower than the P wave. But the farther away the quake is the farther ahead the P wave gets from the S wave. And so we can use this time difference to figure out how far away it is. Uh, we can also use the direction of these waves to figure out the direction that, the, um, that the, the wave is coming from. And putting those together, we can actually figure out where these uh, Mars quakes are happening. And it turns out that most of the quakes that we've been able to locate, we've been able to locate about uh, six or eight uh, quakes fairly well. Almost all of them are located in a single area, a place called Cerberus Fosse. And we already knew from uh, measurements from orbit, from uh, images that we, we saw that the, these were uh, some faults, though some of the very youngest faults on Mars. And they were also associated with some of the very youngest lava flows on Mars. And so what we're finding is that there's a, a great deal of earthquake activity in a region where we know that there's been a seismic activity and and uh, tectonic activity in the last few million years. So uh, before we knew that it was uh, within a few million years, now we know that this uh, geologic activity is happening today, and that's helping us to inform us about uh, the the um, uh, life forces of Mars. You know how alive it is, how active it is today in terms of a geological planet. Um, we were able to get the thickness of the crust by using the, the uh, properties of uh, seismic waves that are similar to uh, light waves. So as the seismic waves come up from the mantle, they actually get bent as they go into the crust. The crust has a different uh, velocity. It's like having a different index of refraction. And so by looking at the bending of these waves and the bouncing of them within the crust, we can actually get the uh, thickness of the crust without having a lot of different seismic stations uh, to get a triangulation of, of the, the events as we do on the Earth. So this has um, allowed us to, to figure out what the thickness of the crust is. We actually have two different um, uh, estimates of the crustal thickness. One is uh, a, a, thick, uh, a model with two layers, um, has an internal layer at about eight kilometers, eight or nine kilometers, and a, a a boundary between the crust and mantle at about 20 kilometers. Um, we also have another interpretation of the data right now that could have a, 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 a boundary at the, the nine kilometer level and around 20 kilometers and then a, the final uh, boundary down at about um, 37 kilometers. So uh, it's difficult to tell the difference right now between a distinct layer at depth and sort of a reverberation and extra bounce within the crust uh, in our data but we're uh, using other methods to sort of uh, uh, figure out what, which of these two models is, 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 is the correct one. And it's looking like the three layer model with about a, a 37 uh, kilometer crust is the one that, that is, is the correct one. Um, we've been able to get the structure of the upper mantle again by looking at the paths of these waves. So these are um, the center panel here shows the path of waves from uh, the Mars quakes to our uh, seismometer. And this shows us you know, what part of the planet we can actually 
resolve which part we can actually see with these seismic waves. So well, the, the deepest waves are going down uh, deeper than about a thousand kilometers. And of course we get more and more resolution, more and more information as we go uh, shallower, uh, where we get more and more wave paths going from the Mars quakes that are closest to us. And by looking at these waves that um, go through the planet and some waves that actually bounce off the, the, the off the inside of the planet and give multiple paths through the planet. It gives us more and more information about the interior and it allows us to look at the structure of the upper mantle of Mars. And so you can see at the top, uh, on, on the right hand side, you can see the velocity structure. This is the, 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 the uh, the, the speed at which seismic waves travel and the speed it depends both on the composition of the material and on its temperature and you can see that um, one of these waves actually decreases in velocity as it goes down uh, this is a uh, 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 so-called low velocity zone and it tells us something about how temperature is increasing so it means that we have a, a relatively warm mantle the, the crust acts as an insulator and the heat gets trapped below the, the crust warming up the upper mantle and uh, causing uh, the, the volcanism that we see on Mars. And so we're finally starting to understand the, 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 uh, the causes and the mechanisms by which uh, volcanic activity uh, occurs on Mars. And finally, we've gotten uh, a measure of the size of the, the Martian core. This is one of our, our, our most important objectives because the core is, is vital to understanding the, the formation of a planet. Uh, so much of the planet's uh, formation is is uh, tied up in the way that the core forms. Uh, the, as as that material sinks to the to the, to the center of the planet, it actually dissolves material in it. And so inside the core, there's not only nickel and iron, but there are also lighter elements which change its density, change its melting temperature, and allow it to to maintain its molten state uh, over over time. We're able to get the size of the core by looking at waves that actually bounce and reflect off the top of the core. Um, we used uh, those those uh, events in Cerberus Fosse. Turns out to be just the right distance to be able to bounce waves off the core. And by looking at the timing of these these waves, uh, we were able to measure the core radius. Um, this core radius is big. It's bigger than what we expected. We thought it was going to be about uh, 1,700 kilometers. It's about 130 kilometers larger than that. That's uh, not a lot, but it's a lot in terms of, of the scientific implications because we um, <clears throat> the, the size of the core is connected to its density. Um, here, um, we were able to get the density by a different method. We can actually use, in, order, in addition to seismology, we're using precision tracking of the InSight lander to look at the wobble of the Mar Martian planet and to understand something about its, its structure in terms of its density. So when we send a radio signal uh, to the InSight lander on Mars, uh, we have what's called a coherent transponder. And that takes the radio wave and uh, turns it around and sends it right back to Earth without breaking the uh, phase of that wave. And so by looking at the uh, Doppler shift of that wave, the, the change in its frequency, as well as the time it takes to go from Earth to Mars and back again, we can uh, actually find, figure out the location of the, the, of the Martian lander uh, in inertial space to an accuracy of, of about 10 centimeters. Not 10 meters, not kilometers, 10 centimeters uh, in, in absolute space. So um, the deep space tracking networks on, on, on Earth um, perform this incredible measurement to figure out the location of, of our of our lander. And of course, our lander is on the surface of Mars, and as Mars rotates, we can actually look at the arc that it that it makes as the as the planet rotates. <coughs> Excuse me, and figure out where that rotation pole is, where the north pole of Mars is at any any moment. Um, and that pole moves around. It, it uh, moves on a, on a couple of different time scales. It, it does something called a precession, which is the same motion that uh, a spinning top makes. It, it wobbles around uh, due to torques, due torques from um, the gravity uh, on Earth. In the case of Mars, those torques are due to the, the, the pull of the sun on the, the, the um, equatorial bulge. And that, that precession takes about 165,000 years. And the, the, the speed of that precession depends on 
the, the, the concentration of density within the planet. So the so-called moment of inertia, uh, which is the, the, um, uh, a measure of how much of the mass is concentrated in that dense core at the center. So by looking at that, uh, that's the speed of that precession, we can figure out how much of that material is in the center of the planet. Um, but we don't know whether it's very dense material in a small core or less dense material in a larger core unless we measure the faster uh, wobble, so the so-called nutation. And those nutations happen on less than a year time scale. So that's a, a, a very different uh, speed of wobble. Um, so we were able to measure both of those things with insight. Um, and we've measured the precession before with other spacecraft, but this is the first time we were able to measure the nutation. So this nutation is a, a wobble of about 250 meters. So the North Pole of Mars moves about 250 meters over the course of the year. And by measuring the uh, exact size of that wobble, we're able to get the size of the of, uh, density of the Martian core. Um, because as the core sort of uh, sloshes around inside, moves around inside Mars, it affects the entire planet. And that measurement that we're making uh, allows us to figure out what the, the uh, uh, size and density are. And so by looking at the, um, the wobble of Mars, we can get the, the radius. It's not as, as precise as a, seism a seismic uh, measurement, but it uh, verifies the seismic measurement. And we're able to actually get the density of the core. So the core density, um, this you can see the number 6,000 plus or minus 300. Um, the important thing about that number is it's very low, okay? So just as the, the core radius was larger than we expected, the density was much smaller than we expected. A pure iron core would be more than 6,500 kilograms per cubic meter. And so in order to have a density this low, we have to have more than 25%, almost a quarter uh, of, the, the, of the core is, is composed of sulfur um, or perhaps oxygen or carbon, but sulfur is the most likely element. Uh, this is really, really difficult to explain with our current models. And so all of uh, the theoreticians, the people who um, have models of planetary formation are all going back and, and trying to uh, re, re, re formulate their models in order to explain this measurement. So um, uh, Insight has actually done uh, its job, which I, I felt like its job was to sort of break the models that we have today because when you have models that have very little data associated with them, um, they tell you things that, that aren't true and data is what allows you to make your models uh, be honest. And so now we're, we're, we're starting to uh, construct some honest models that are actually um, going to describe what Mars is today and have a, a, a chance of understanding what Mars was like four and a half billion years ago. So now we can go back to this figure. This is the, the, the figure I showed at the beginning of the talk. Um, now, instead of having these question marks, all of these question marks have been replaced by, by actual numbers. So we know where the, 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 the size of the crust is. It's uh, somewhere around 30 kilometers, plus or minus 15 or so. We know that the core is liquid from uh, uh, insights measurements, and we know the size of the core and also its density. Um, there's also uh, other uh, uh, variations in the in the mantle composition uh, on the Earth. We know that where those are, we know what their density is. On Mars, we now have measurements of the depths of these things. Uh, that helps us to t understand more about the pressure and temperature inside of Mars um, and, and so forth. So now all these question marks are gone in the next uh, edition of the, the Encyclopedia of the Solar System will have to be rewritten with the uh, results from the InSight mission. Um, so you know, in, in addition to all these uh, rather uh, esoteric and, and perhaps difficult to understand uh, scientific measurements that the seismometer is making, InSight does do other science at Mars. Uh, we have a, a atmospheric weather station that, uh, that measures the weather at this location on Mars every single day. And that's uh, uh, telling us more and more about the atmosphere of Mars, understanding its circulation, understanding its pro processes, that again, help us to understand you know, how uh, the weather works on Earth because now we have a, a different laboratory with a different set of conditions to uh, refine our models of atmospheric behavior and understand how the Earth's weather works. 
Um, we also have these cameras, which also helps us to uh, understand the geology of Mars. Um, we have two different cameras. One is a uh, 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 fisheye lens, which was mostly there to help us understand the um, material right in front of the, the lander so that we could do our, um, our uh, deployment of the seismometer. Uh, the picture up here in the upper uh, left-hand corner is the first picture we took on Mars uh, through that camera. And you can see that it was uh, very difficult to see the planet. It's, the, the camera was covered with, with dirt. And we were, we were uh, very concerned about this. We didn't know whether we'd be able to use this camera. But over the course of time with the wind blowing, all that dirt was uh, removed. And so this is the same uh, image. Uh, now it is uh, uh, clear of dirt. And you can see instead of uh, a pristine planet, we now have uh, some, some things that are sitting there that were sent there by, by humans. Uh, the seismometer there in the center and our heat flow probe over on the left, which unfortunately uh, was not successful. We also have uh, another more high resolution camera that took these other images. Uh, this is just uh, a, a sampling of images. Uh, the, the one uh, in the center left is uh, looking at the deck right after we had uh, removed the, the, the uh, instruments from the deck. Um, the one in the, the center right is showing uh, what the uh, material underneath the lander where the rockets had actually uh, uh, uncovered some of the rocks under the lander. And finally, the one on the, the, the right is one that I'm particularly proud of. Um, the, um, the object in the center of that picture is the calibration target for the camera. It's uh, what we use to uh, calibrate both the focus and, and the pictures. But part of that uh, calibration target uh, is the flags of all the, the, the nations that have participated in the InSight mission. Uh, InSight was not just a, a U.S. mission, it was a collaboration of uh, many different countries across the world, uh, most of them in Europe, but also in, in, in Asia. And so um, I think that this mission could not have been done without the uh, intellectual uh, power of the, of the entire world. Uh, in fact, both of the instruments on, on InSight were built uh, outside the United States. The seismometer was a collaboration between France, Germany, uh, Switzerland and and uh, the, the United Kingdom. Uh, the heat flow probe was built in Germany and Poland. And so um, this is really a, an international mission, not just a U.S. mission. And I think that's uh, the way that uh, that space should be explored. And finally, these uh, these two uh, circular uh, objects just to the right of the calibration target. These are our microchips on which um, people were uh, asked to send their names to to, uh, to the InSight project. And these were all engraved uh, with, uh, with uh, 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 nanotechnology onto these chips. And there's 2.2 million names uh, that were sent to Mars. And perhaps, uh, perhaps some of you in the audience even sent your name into NASA. And so if you look very, very closely, you may, you may be able to see your name on, on one of those chips. So um, now InSight is still operating on Mars, but we're in a challenging situation. Uh, the dust on Mars has been covering our solar panels. You can see on the left here, this is uh, the, the, a picture of the panels after, after 10 days on Mars, and on the right after uh, about two years on Mars. And we've now been uh, almost uh, twice as long on Mars, so it's even dustier than that now. And so our solar energy is down to only about 20% of what it was earlier in the mission. It's getting very difficult to um, operate our instruments. Uh, we are able to do a little bit about that. We've actually been able to clean off the, the solar arrays by using a novel approach. We use our robotic arm with a scoop to actually scoop up some material uh, from the surface, move it across the, the, the spacecraft, and then we dumped it very close to the um, uh, solar panel and allowed the, the sand to uh, go across the solar panel and actually uh, clean it off. And so if you look at... Um, the difference between this picture and um, this picture right here. You can see there the solar panel on the left is very bright. And after we dump the material, it's quite a bit darker. And that darkness is the actual solar panel showing through. So we actually were able to sandblast it and increase our solar power by about 10%, which allowed us to keep operating our instruments. And so we're uh, continuing to try to do this, clean off our solar arrays a little bit and put off uh, sort of the in inevitable uh, final uh, resting of the mission. 
which will probably occur sometime next year. So um, thank you for listening. Um, that's uh, uh, the, the, all I have to talk about today. Uh, this is a, an image of, of sunset uh, that we took on Mars uh, uh, about 150 days into the mission. And you can always go to uh, our website at mars.nasa.gov slash insight and see the latest pictures and, and uh, weather data uh, as we get, get it back from Mars. So thank you very much. Professor Bennett, thank you so much for your uh, amazing talk, telling us about this uh, amazing uh, mission. And we have some questions. Um, hold on a second. People, uh, thank you for your talk and telling how nice it was, your images. And let us see the questions. Um, so, uh, can you tell to us about the technological challenger about build the sism sismometer and to get the information out of there? Well, the seismometer was a was a was an immense uh, technological challenge. I mean, you can imagine <clears throat> trying to measure something at the atomic level, even in a laboratory, is is difficult, but to be able to, to uh, make such a thing ha work, um, <clears throat> not only outside the laboratory, but uh, uh, in, the, in the dirt on another planet was, was very difficult. Um, we actually had to delay the launch of, of, of the, uh, the mission by, by two years because the, the seismometer in its final testing, we uh, detected a leak in the uh, vacuum system. So, you know, the vacuum system insulates the seismometer uh, thermally. It also uh, uh, shields it from variations in, in atmospheric pressure. And the leak that we, did, that we found in this, uh, in this uh, enclosure was coming through where the, uh, the, the wires feed through into the, into the inside so that we can actually bring signals out uh, to, the, uh, to, to our data system. Uh, and that leak was uh, such that... Um, if you had uh, the, the tires on your car, if it was leaking at the same as this, uh, the seismometer is leaking, it would be about uh, 50 years before you would notice, you know, one, uh, one uh, 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 PSI difference in the tires. So it, you would never even notice it on your car tire, but this would be enough to completely destroy our measurement on Mars. So we had to go back and it took us a, about another year to uh, redesign that uh, that uh, thermal that uh, the the vacuum enclosure so that the seismometers could work, and so uh, we went through many many iterations like this, uh, 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 both uh, in the vacuum system, in the measurement system itself, uh, looking at, at very small changes in the in in the stresses that that would that would cause a. Uh, uh, um, incorrect uh, measurements. And so that took us um, many years just to get the seismometers working. And that's not even counting the, the difficulty of actually landing on Mars. I mean, the lens system that, that InSight used was uh, developed um, uh, really over, over 50 years. I mean, it was first, uh, first used in Viking. It was uh, uh, refined by the, the, the Phoenix lander uh, back in uh, the early uh, 2000s. And um, of course, every time you land on Mars is uh, is is a is an extremely difficult feat that, uh, yes, that yes. Has, has been only performed uh, a handful of times. Uh, most recently, by the uh, the the amazing uh, Zhurong lander from from China, which was uh, a, a, a really uh, a amazing feat as well. Thanks so, Thanks much. so much. We have another, we have another question. question. Yes. Did Insight find any clue about why, who, or when Mars lost its magnetic fields? Um, that is one of the, the um, important, most important questions that we're actually uh, trying to answer. And, and uh, that's going to, to, to take uh, a lot more analysis, but having the, the size of the Martian core, and particularly having the details of the, um, the composition, uh, is, is, is very critical to the people who are making those kinds of models. Um, the magnetic field generation is a very complex process. It, it requires not only 
um, a um, a liquid core, a liquid uh, uh, conducting core, but it also requires something to create turbulence in that core. So if the core is just uh, rotating, there will be no magnetic field. But if it has uh, turbulence where the uh, currents inside the core are creating um, uh, uh, vor vortex uh, types of motions, uh, then you can create a magnetic field. And that requires uh, some kind of motion other than just the rotation. And usually we do we, we think that it happens for the earth um, with thermal convection, the uh, heat from the inside of the core causing the material to rise up. And as it rises, the centrifugal forces uh, uh, cause these uh, uh, vortex motions which cause the magnetic field. And so the, 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 uh, um, the thermal history of the core as well as the fact that it's, it's molten is, is what's important. And so knowing that the uh, core is a certain size, knowing that it has a certain uh, heat capacity, uh, knowing that its um, melting temperature, which is, which is affected by the um, uh, light elements which are in the core as well as the iron, these are all critical factors in the theories of, of uh, magnetic field generation. And these uh, are just now being uh, put into these models and, and uh, researchers are starting to understand. And I expect in the next year or so uh, to start seeing um, papers by of, of scientists in this area. But these are the critical measurements that, that they needed. And now that they have them, um, I expect the, the, those kinds of results to come out soon, but we don't have them quite yet. Thank you so much. Uh, now two correlated questions. Uh, we, would not be better to have two seismometer and the question is, is Perseverance, another mission, carrying similar equipment? Because if two seismometry, we'll be able to, to see how the waves move around, right? Yes, I mean, um, most, uh, virtually all seismology on Earth is done with uh, networks of seismometers, many, yes. many seismometers. And of course, the more seismometers you have, the better your information is, you get more uh, paths through the planet. You have, uh, you're able to do um, <clears throat> coincidence measurements between the two seismometers, do interferometry. There's many, many different things you can do with multiple seismometers. <clears throat> and in fact, I spent um, about 10 years in the 90s trying to um, convince NASA to send uh, a mission to Mars with, uh, with uh, four five, even 12 seismometers to do this kind of, uh, these kinds of measurements. But of course, you can imagine that uh, uh, if you have uh, two seismometers, it's going to cost much more than one seismometer. And so, um, you know, these things are always uh, constrained by budgets, by, by, by cost. Uh, and, and so after 10 years of, of uh, not being successful at, at uh, convincing uh, NASA or, or ESA or the other space agencies to um, fly these very expensive missions. Um, myself and, and, and my scientific colleagues, you know, sort of went back and uh, looked through the scientific uh, uh, knowledge for the, all the methods that you can use for one seismometer to get the kinds of, of uh, information we, we, we need. Um, and some of these measurements are very, um, very coarse and primitive compared to what we can do on the Earth. But given that we need the basic knowledge of Mars, they were enough to do that. And it was at a price that, that NASA was, was willing to afford. And so um, hopefully someday we will get more seismometers on Mars. Perseverance does not carry a seismometer, but uh, there are plans for other missions to go to Mars in the future with, with more seismometers. And given the uh, information that InSight has, uh, first of all, proving that there are Mars quakes, which we did not know for certain before this, and showing that we can get this kind of information, I think it will give more scientific uh, value to those, those kinds of missions. And perhaps someday in the future, uh, we will have you know two, three, or four seismometers on Mars that will be, enable us to get the more detailed information about the inside of Mars that we have uh, at the Earth with uh, our seismic networks. Okay, thank you. And how about water, under, under, uh, underground water? Uh, was it able to find something from the measure? Um, unfortunately, the, the instruments that we have on, on InSight really aren't, um, they're not optimized to look at uh, things that are relatively shallow, just in the upper few kilometers. Um, 
we have some 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 ways to look at the uh, the top mm, 10 to 50 meters um, using some of our instruments and things that are 10 and, and hundreds and thousands of kilometers deep, but there's kind of a, a blind spot for insight in, in the, the kind of mid crustal uh, region. So we're not really very sensitive to water. Um, what we uh, what we can do with insight is is uh, provide a, a baseline. So I think for a future mission that, that goes and and perhaps we'll able to use um, uh, some different kinds of instruments, uh, maybe ground penetrating radar or uh, uh, measurements like that. Uh, the insight measurements will give them what the um, overall background is, but um, insight itself isn't able to, to tell us much about water on Mars, I'm afraid. I see. Uh, now, share to us about your feeling. How do you feel about having your uh, instrument in this spacecraft uh. and just started to land on Mars and the, how anxious you were, uh, expecting that it would work fine. How was that? How was that moment? Because you, oh, were, wow. you, you were told him that you had worked on that for 30 years. Uh, yeah, I, I, I worked on this. I did work on this for 30 years. I spent uh, uh, many years, you know, uh, convincing, you know, the, the science community of, of the value of this mission, many years convincing uh, the NASA agency of the value of the mission, uh, working with my colleagues, uh, many, many others, not just myself, you know, designing the spacecraft, designing the instruments, and then finally, you know, building these things and operating it on Mars. I've been working on it since uh, since the the, uh, the late 1980s, actually. And so even earlier than that, you know, when I was a child uh, and, and the astronauts were first going into space, you know, I dreamed of, 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 uh, of working on another planet. And of course, you know, I, I, as a child, I thought of, you know, going up in a rocket myself and, and landing on another planet, um, which is uh, turned out not to be practical. But, but for me, you know, to be able to, you know, be part of a mission that actually, you know, sends something from, from our planet across space to, to Mars and to be, you know, present when the, the rocket actually, you know, lifts off the launch pad and sends this thing out into space, you know, something that, that I've, I've touched with my own hands and, and, uh, and, and it's, has left this planet forever. It's just a, a, an incredible feeling. And of course, the landing itself, I, I think I must have held my breath for, for five minutes <laughs> when, 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 when it was landing because once uh, the spacecraft is, is, is that far away, it really is, is by itself. It is, it's, it's alone. It's doing everything it, it, it needs to do by itself, and we can only you know, watch and, and hope that it's successful. <clears throat> and when we got back that first picture from the surface of Mars, and you know, I, I remember seeing the first pictures from from the moon, uh, uh, from from the Apollo astronauts, and and to to think that you know I had some some small part in that, and that some small part of me is on another planet, is just it's really, it's it's an indescribable feeling. And even today, you know, I can go out go out in my backyard and look up in the sky and see that tiny little you know red dot in the sky, and and you know look and see can i can i actually see my see my lander on mars and, and of course i can't see it but i can imagine it there and it's knowing that it's actually there um my it, it just it just makes my imagination fly ah, congratulations and maybe the last question how many people works in the mission and the beginning and and now how many people was involved in that um, I, I think probably if you look at all the people who built the various different things, all the scientists who have worked on it, uh, there's probably, I would say, about four or 5,000 people. Of course, it's, it's so hard to, to, uh, to count because, you know, every piece of the spacecraft has smaller pieces that are, have smaller pieces. And so there are, you know, there are, are manufacturers and sub-manufacturers and, and sub-manufacturers to, down to the people who, who you know, built the, the screws that put it together, you know, there's, there, there are thousands of people, um, but in directly uh, working on our project, I think at the, at the peak of the mission, um, when we were actually building it, I think there were about 500 people working 
um, at JPL, um, at Lockheed Martin in Colorado, uh, across the, the globe at, um, at DLR in Germany, uh, Kness in, in, in France, um, and, and, and scientists all over the world. Um, there was probably about 500 at the peak. Um, today, I would say at JPL, there's about 50 people still working on, on InSight uh, and about 50 people at the, uh, the spacecraft uh, operation uh, at, at Lockheed. And then um, on the, and, and probably a, a, another 50 people in Europe uh, doing operations. So about 150 people uh, working at actually uh, running the spacecraft, commanding it, keeping it safe. And then our science team, is about 250 people strong, people who are, are actually working with the data. So um, even today, there's, there's probably, you know, three or 400 people who are working directly on, on this mission. And again, they're spread all the way across the planet. Okay. So, Dr. Bennett, a lot of people telling congratulations to you. Thank you for your amazing talk. And uh, one question. Can we keep in your presentation in our uh, YouTube in our YouTube channel? Yes, yes. I, yes you can yes. keep it there. I'll, I will. I will sign the, the release okay. form. It's, it's, okay. it's all legal. I'm, I'm happy for you to uh, keep that and, and share it with uh, okay. with other people at, uh, at 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 your university and and uh, across the, the country. Okay, Doctor Barnett. Thank you so much. It was an honor to have you here. We hope. You have a successful time analyzing the data and that your uh, spacecraft uh, still work with, uh, continue to work for long years, okay? Thanks Thank so you. Much. It's been my pleasure. pleasure. Thank you very to much. you here uh, in the next uh, uh, to visit us in person. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much. We're very proud to have you here. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Obrigado a todos e se você não é, se inscreveu no nosso canal, faça, tá uma boa oportunidade. Obrigado a todos. Até a próxima semana.